Council has the following announcements. The first three catechism classes are uh, canceled this week in line with school break. The pre-confession class will meet in the consistory room at 7.30. The offerings today are for the needy and uh, for matters for prayer in addition to the two that are in the bulletin. Please uh, remember in prayer Derek Skepper's father who is now in palliative care. Understand? Congregation of our Lord, where does our help come from? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise God by singing selection number Psalm 108 stanzas 1 and 2.
And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor daughter, nor your manservant, or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord in his teaching summarized the law by saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Let us respond to God's law by singing Psalm 116, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. to God in prayer. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before you on this, the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection and new life, a day set apart from every other day, a day when we are privileged to rest from our ordinary labors and rest again and be reminded again to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we know that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with heart and soul and mind and strength, nor have we loved neighbor as ourselves. We fall short of the mark, and we have sinned. But we praise and thank you that when we cry to you, deliver us, O Lord, you preserve our lives. You are our faithful God and Savior. You 
are just and show your grace and favor. And in compassion you fulfill your word, the promise that all who repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in his finished work and not their own deed, all our sins are forgiven for his sake. We pray now, glorious Father, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us, that we might know the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and your great power for us who believe. Out of your glorious riches, strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Root us and ground us in your love. And may we have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all your fullness. Fill us with the knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Enable us to live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him in every way. Enable us to bear fruit in every good work, growing in our knowledge of you. May we be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, so that we have great endurance and patience and joy. We rejoice and give thanks that you have qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. We give you thanks that you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son, through whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us continue to worship in song by singing Psalm 119, stanzas 40 through 42. Scripture 
Reading is taken first from Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 9 and reading through verse 20. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles are alike, alike are under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. And then my text for today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Luke, chapter 19, the familiar story, perhaps, I trust, uh, familiar to most of you, of Zacchaeus. Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And this event occurs a day or two before the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, uh, just a, a week or so before Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the great questions that we all need to be clear on is why did Jesus come into the world? There's a lot of misunderstanding among those who have heard about Jesus regarding why he came into the world. Perhaps the most common notion current in the world today is that Jesus came into the world to teach us to be better people by giving us some good teaching and by leaving us an example, we're meant to lift ourselves up and try harder to be better people, to be nicer people. We're all good, but we need a little incentive, and Jesus, with his teaching and example, provide that incentive or encouragement to be better people. But that misses the mark by quite a bit and certainly is not in accord with the words of our text where Jesus says very explicitly why he came into the world. In the last words of the passage that I read to you, 
For the Son of Man came. Why did he come? To seek and to save what was lost. He came into the world to seek and to save what was lost. Certainly his teaching and example are important, but that's not primary. What is primary is he came to seek and to save the lost. And this morning with you I want to consider how that applies in one particular instance, the instance of Zacchaeus. And we want to take note that Zacchaeus was indeed a lost man and that indeed it was Jesus who sought him, not the other way around, and that it was Jesus who saved him, not Zacchaeus, who saved himself. First of all, then, let's consider the fact that Zacchaeus was a lost man. Now, this is a point worth emphasizing because he doesn't fit the mold of what we normally think of when we hear that expression, a lost man. He doesn't fit the mold for two reasons. Number one, he's not a pagan, an unbeliever. And number two, he's not a, a lost soul, a, 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 a prodigal, a, someone who's made a mess of their lives and who has hit rock bottom. Let's think about that for a moment. He's not a pagan. He's not an unbeliever. He's not someone far removed from God. He is a Jew. He is a descendant of Abraham. He was most certainly circumcised on the eighth day. He was taught the scriptures. And there's no reason to doubt that he believed the scriptures as far as any Jew believed the scriptures. Although he wasn't popular among his Jews, he was probably one who went to the temple and if they didn't like his prayer, they didn't mess with him because he had some Roman soldiers to enforce his, uh, his job and his position in society. So he was, he was able to, to be an observant Jew. He was a member of the covenant, a covenant member of the people of God and yet, when Jesus came to his house, he said, today, not 30 or 40 years ago when he was born and circumcised, but today, salvation has come to this house. Prior to that day, he was not a saved man. He was a lost man, even though he was a member of the covenant community. But not only was he a lost man in spite of his covenant membership, he was a lost man in spite of the fact that he was not a down and outer, a skid row bum, one who had made a total mess of his life, who had hit rock bottom and had no resources left to himself. On the contrary, he was a successful businessman who understood the ways of the world and, and made the world work for him. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. He had worked hard and risen through the ranks and he had become wealthy. Granted, not many of his fellow Jews liked him, but he could attribute that to envy and the foolishness of those who didn't accommodate themselves to the way things were. Rome ruled. The Jews had no hope of gaining independence. So work with the Romans. Everyone knew that tax collectors made their profit by charging more than they had to pass on to Rome, so he had no problem justifying his actions in his own eyes. He's like many successful businessmen and women in the world today who figure out how the systems work and then make the system work for them. Pragmatism. But if it works, do it. <laughs> That's the ruling business principle then and now. If it works, it's good. Do what is ever necessary to get ahead. And he was good at it. He was successful. He was rich. But again, Jesus said, not until today has salvation come to this house. Salvation wasn't there before. And even not until Jesus had seen a real change in his life. 
we can also see that Zacchaeus that day began to realize that he was a lost man prior to his encounter with Jesus. After receiving Jesus into his home and sitting for a time, we read that he stood up. That indicates that they were in his house now and, and seated. Probably Jesus, when Jesus said, I must stay at your house today, the word can also be interpreted, I must lodge at your house today. He was planning to spend the night and then proceed to Jerusalem the next day for the triumphal entry. Uh, but uh, they, they come to Zacchaeus' home, they sit down, uh, probably there are some servants preparing a meal, and while the meal is being prepared, Jesus is teaching and preaching, and Zacchaeus is listening. And after listening for a time, Zacchaeus stands up and makes his little speech. He will give half of his wealth to the poor. He was only required to give a tenth a tenth, and maybe if he was a farmer, the corner of his fields and whatnot, but only a tenth. He says, I will give half. He recognized that he had been a stingy, hard-hearted, selfish man. And now he's going to change. He's going to become a generous man. And he promised to restore full, fourfold any money that he had defrauded from others a confession of his dishonesty. Fraud implies schemes designed to look legal, which he had gotten away with. You know, Moses required that thieves restore twice what they had stolen. But there was one instance in the Bible where someone who took something valuable from someone else said, this is such a heinous crime, I should pay back fourfold. You remember that one? That was Nathan to David after the incident with Bathsheba. Nathan told the story of the, owner, the rich man who took the poor man's sheep and Nathan in indignation said that is such a heinous crime that that, that person who took the sheep should pay back fourfold for what he has done. Of course then Nathan conveyed the bad news. You are the man. But nevertheless... Zacchaeus now puts himself in that category of one who ought to pay back fourfold for what he has defrauded of others. He too began to see himself as a lost man in his previous life. The lesson here is that the lost that Jesus came to save are, are not just prodigals and pagans. The lost can include covenant members. The lost can include successful, prosperous people who are very pleased with themselves and congratulate themselves for having done so well in life. You know, every Jew who was wealthy was convinced that his wealth was a sign that he was all right with God, that God had blessed him. God had promised prosperity to the faithful. And so, if covenant members are prosperous, they assume that they are among the faithful. Not much has changed. That's still the case. But we must take note that money is not always a sign and is often associated with unfaithfulness. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving, says Paul, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Jesus warned that many who heard the gospel gladly never had that gospel take root in their lives or bear fruit in their lives because they were carried away by the deceitfulness of riches. He's warning covenant people not to congratulate themselves and think of themselves as good people. Because I'm in the covenant and I'm successful with regard to money. We read from 
Romans 3, that passage where Paul begins earlier in that chapter to say how those who are without the law are lost, but then ask, are we all, are we Jews any better? And the answer is no. We're no better. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. In Luke 15, Jesus tells perhaps his most famous parable, commonly known as the parable of the prodigal son. And in the first chapter of that three-chapter parable, it ends, even so, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. Oh, isn't that nice to read? 99 people who need no repentance. Uh, that's us, right? We're the ones that need no repentance. No. Jesus isn't teaching that in the covenant community. There's only one or two here and there that need to repent. Paul makes clear that there are none righteous. No, not one. That no one is saved by covenant membership. We should not presume upon the covenant as if that alone will save anyone. There are plenty of people within the covenant who are not saved because they have not put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Zacchaeus was a lost man, even though he wasn't a pagan, even though he wasn't a bum, a down and outer, but was a financial success. The second thing we need to consider here is that Jesus sought Zacchaeus, not the other way around. It might appear to be the other way around, since Zacchaeus worked very hard to get to see who Jesus was. That's what our text says. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He probably hoped that no one would see him in the undignified position of having climbed a tree. But he went up there to hide. He didn't want to be seen. He was hiding in a tree. He was hiding in the leaves. Someone else did that once in the Bible. Hiding in the bush behind the leaves when he heard the voice of God in the garden. He wasn't anxious to be found. He was afraid. I believe that's how we should understand Zacchaeus at this point as well. Remember, he was what? A chief tax collector. Who did he work for? Rome. What was the messianic hope at that time among the Jews regarding Jesus? Why did they go wild the next day or the day after on Palm Sunday welcoming Jesus in Jerusalem? What did they want from him? They wanted a king. And why did they want a king? They wanted a king to get rid of Rome. And what would happen to the Jewish collaborators once Jesus had led the rebellion and kicked out the Romans? What would the Jews then do with the Jews who had worked for the Romans? You don't have to wonder too much. If you know any Dutch history, you know that there were Dutch collaborators with the Nazis and when the Netherlands was liberated, it didn't go so well for them. Zacchaeus is afraid. He wants to see who Jesus is. He wants to size him up. Who is this man that threatens my livelihood and perhaps is a threat to my very existence, my life? I don't want him to notice me, but I want to check him. I want to size him up. Some will say, well, when Jesus called out to him, Zacchaeus received him gladly, as if that's what, Jesus, what, what Zacchaeus had hoped for. There's nothing in the text that indicates that Zacchaeus was hoping 
to have Jesus come to his home. He was hiding from Jesus. And he had every reason to be scared of Jesus. The reason he was glad was because it was the opposite of what he expected. He had never met Jesus before. Jesus didn't, wasn't supposed to know who he was. And he was hiding from Jesus. And Jesus, for no good reason that Zacchaeus could figure out, nobody was supposed to see him, nobody was supposed to know he was there, Jesus stops right beneath him, looks up, and addresses this man by name who he had never met before, demanding that he be able to lodge at his house that night. Now, even not knowing what tone of voice Jesus might have used, the very request of, I must lodge at your house tonight, is a friendly gesture. And I believe it's very safe to assume that there was a very friendly tone in Jesus' voice. The very opposite of what Zacchaeus was anticipating or expecting from this man who threatened his job and his very life. The man he was trying to size up but didn't want to be seen by. Zacchaeus was blown away by an unexpected friendship from the one he thought was his enemy. Jesus was seeking him. Now certainly the Spirit was probably working in Zacchaeus prior to this event, using Zacchaeus' fears to bring him to the right place at the right time. But again, it was Jesus who said later on that day, now, today, after Zacchaeus has repented, then and then only does Jesus say, salvation has come to this house. Jesus makes clear in his Gospel of John, no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. I came to seek, to seek and to save the lost. In the same way, you are not here by accident today. You know, every Sunday, people all across the world go to church some for good reasons and some for not so good reasons. Some with true hearts changed by the grace of God, desiring to give God the worship and praise to his name. But some come because it's good for business. Some come because it's easier to, to do that than to deal with the people who will give them a hard time or her a hard time if they don't do it. And, but for whatever reason, God has drawn you here today. And like Zacchaeus, he wants you to hear the gospel, the good news that you don't deserve. You are dead in your trespasses and sins and of yourself have no right to expect anything but that Jesus is against you. Like Adam, we ought to be afraid of the just judge of the universe. But like Adam and Zacchaeus, when we are found of him, the message is of hope and of grace and of love. I came to seek and to save you who are lost, you who are selfish and self-centered, who are mere pragmatists, always thinking about enriching yourself. I'm here to bring you grace, to bring you forgiveness, to bring you salvation. Jesus came to seek, and he is still seeking you, who of yourselves are lost. Zacchaeus was lost. Jesus was seeking him. But did Jesus really save him? Some people look at this text and, and scratch their heads. They say, you know, it might appear that, that Zacchaeus saved himself or was saved by circumstances over which uh, had nothing to do with Jesus. 
After all, Jesus didn't say he was saved until after Zacchaeus expressed his intention to give half of his money to the poor and to restore fourfold anything that he may have ever defrauded from anyone. Wasn't Jesus just rewarding him with some assurances because Zacchaeus had earned through his repentance the salvation that Jesus says he now possesses? Didn't he contribute to his own salvation through what he did and all his... Well, he hadn't followed through on them, but he had good intentions. And, and there are a lot of people who think, yeah, I think God ought to forgive me because, yeah, I mess up sometimes, but I have good intentions. No, Jesus makes clear why Zacchaeus received salvation that day. The exact words of Jesus, because he too is a son of Abraham. Because he too is a son of Abraham. That's why salvation has come to this house today. Now again, people look at that and say, well, okay, Jesus didn't save him. <laughs> he was saved by the circumstances of his birth. We're back to the covenant saves us. Every child of Abraham is going to be saved. No, that's not what Jesus is saying here. The Bible is quite clear that not every son of Abraham, not every member of the covenant is saved. In John 6, Jesus told the Jews that they were not children of Abraham. They were children of their father, the devil. Even though they had been circumcised on the eighth day, even though they had the right genetic heritage, and indeed had come from Abraham through the flesh, they were not of their father, the Abraham. They were of their father, the devil. In Romans 9, Paul laments that so many of his fellow Jews were not saved and says this in Romans 9, verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brother, my kinsman, according to the flesh. But that wasn't possible. Did that mean that the covenant had failed? No. He writes again, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are, of his, off they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Paul goes on, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. And who are the children of, of, of the promise? Well, we know this in Romans 4, it says that Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that right would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And again Paul writes in Galatians 3, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of the faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The Bible is clear in both Old and New Testament that Abraham was saved by grace through faith, and that the true children of Abraham are those who are of the faith of Abraham, who believe as Abraham. And when Jesus said of Zacchaeus, he too is a child of Abraham, he's saying that Zacchaeus has come to believe. He now shares the faith of Abraham. And as Abraham believed God and was counted righteous, so Zacchaeus believes in Jesus and is counted righteous. His repentance didn't save him or earn him salvation. His Jewish blood didn't save him. His covenant membership didn't save him. We're saved by grace through faith, through faith alone. Jesus could make the bold assertion that salvation had come because of the evidence of his faith. 
His repentance was the evidence of his faith. It showed the genuineness of his faith, but was not the basis of his salvation. The basis of his salvation was Jesus Christ, and salvation came to him through faith in Jesus. Likewise, you can only be saved through faith. A faith that shows itself to be real through genuine repentance. Again, there are those who think, well, if I go to church and I go to catechism and at the end of catechism I make a public profession of faith, then I'm covered. And it doesn't matter that I get drunk on weekends. It doesn't matter that I fornicate with my girlfriend. It doesn't matter that I selfishly hoard money all my life and not uh, share it with the needy and the poor. I don't have to do those things. I'm, I'm covered. I did all the prescribed things. I said the right words. I said I believed in Jesus and I go to church. And Salvation came to Zacchaeus' house because his faith was genuine because he truly repented of his sins. Now we might wonder, how did Jesus save Zacchaeus? Well, it's only hinted at in our text. It's hinted at in the context, because the context is that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And there's an interesting contrast here. We know that Jesus goes to Jerusalem to be put up on a tree. He was raised up on a tree to bear the wrath of God against the sin of the world. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He bore the curse for us. That's how Jesus saved Zacchaeus. Jesus went up on the tree and bore the curse on the tree so that Zacchaeus wouldn't have to bear the curse on a tree but could come down out of the tree and have fellowship with Jesus. Jesus saves us through his death on the cross by which he bore the curse that our sins deserve. And when we trust in that and not in ourselves, we too are assured Salvation has come to your house today. May God give us such faith. Amen. Let us respond to God's word today by singing hymn 81, all the stanzas.
Let us unite our hearts together and come before God in prayer. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank you that with Jesus you give us all that we stand in need of. We pray, O Father, that you would be with your people this day and encourage and strengthen each one. And we pray that you would reach out to those who are lost to open their hearts to hear the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus. O Father, gather in the lost and build up the faithful and strengthen your church. May your name be glorified in and through us. May the gospel go forth in the power of the Spirit, turning hearts away from the things that are perishing and uh, teaching us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that you will supply our every need. We come to you as needy people and pray that you would be close to those who are sick or ill. We pray for those who are dealing with colds and flu and various illnesses. We pray for those who are suffering from the infirmities of age and disability. We pray, Father, that we would not become discouraged or lose heart, but know that your grace is sufficient for our need. We pray that you would comfort those who mourn. We remember especially the Harsevoort family as with the passing of uh, Stuart's brother, we pray, Father, that you would comfort and encourage their hearts as they gather for the funeral, and uh, we pray that the gospel may, may be proclaimed, and that uh, you would give uh, safety to all the family as they travel together and uh, return home again. Have mercy upon them, Father, and grant them your grace and Holy Spirit. We pray for our brother Kay Samoon as he uh, deals with skin cancer. We pray that you, we thank you, Father, for the doctors and nurses and for the good care that is available and pray that you would speed healing in his body and restore him to health and strength. We uh, pray for uh, Garrett uh, Skeffer's uh, father, now in palliative care. We pray, Father, as uh, his time on earth draws to a close, that you would give him strength of faith and grace to know that you are with him and will never leave him. May uh, he uh, remember that his comfort in both life and death is that uh, he is not his own, but belongs to the faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And may his faith be of inspiration uh, to uh, his family and loved ones around him. We pray, Father, that you would be with widows and widowers, that you would be with them in their loneliness and uh, grief and sorrow. May your presence and may the love and fellowship of the body of Christ be a support to them in their time of need. Father, we uh, pray for our nation and for those who rule over us. We pray, Father, that you would uh, raise up for our nation leaders who honor you and your word and who recognize that the righteous standards revealed in your word are the righteous standards by which we ought to live and be governed. And we pray, pray that where as a nation we have departed from those righteous standards, there may be a change of heart and mind and uh, corresponding change in the law. We pray especially, O oh Father, that we may turn away from the culture of death in uh, uh, abortion and euthanasia and uh, cherish every life from the moment of conception till natural death, regardless of its degree of dependence. Uh, we pray, Father, that we may uh, cherish life created in your image and uh, uphold it and support it. And we pray, Father, that uh, abortion would not only become uh, uh, illegal but uh, unthinkable, that people would see it as the horror that it is and, and turn away from it. We pray, Father, that you would uh, uh, enable our nation to repent of uh, great sexual immorality that is uh, even sanctioned by law, and that we would honor the institution of marriage as you have revealed it as the covenantal union of one man and one woman, a lifelong covenantal union of one man and one woman. We pray, Father, that uh, we may all hold the institution of marriage in high regard. And we pray, Father, that we would turn away from the culture of greed and avarice that is so evident in uh, raffles and lotteries and gambling. And pray, Father, that we would learn to do honest work with our hands so that we may share with those who are in need Help us to uphold the dignity and honor of, uh, of good work. Father, we pray that you would uh, bless our nation, and uh, we pray for the United States also, as a uh, new president has taken office there, that you would lead him in the path of righteousness that will promote uh, righteousness and peace there and around the world. 
We pray, Father, that uh, you would have mercy upon the church, that we may be a, a, a bold witness in the, these dark times, and that uh, we might uh, lift up Christ in the preaching of the gospel and call all men everywhere to faith in Christ, and uh, that you would gather in all those destined for eternal life. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we bring our offering this day for the needy. We pray that you would be with the deacons to give them wisdom in the distribution of the gifts of God's people and uh, that our gifts and prayers may be of an encouragement to those who are in need. O Lord, hear us and answer us, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us worship God with our offering for the needy, after which, without further announcement, we'll sing the fifth stanza of Psalm 108. We sang the first two stanzas at the beginning of the service, and now at the end we'll sing the fifth stanza, standing to sing.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.